So, uh, as you just heard, I'm a cosmochemist in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at UCLA. Being a cosmochemist, what that means is that I study meteorites, and I'm interested in what the meteorites can tell us about the origin of the solar system. So that's my topic for this evening, is how did we get here? Now, because I was trained in the geological sciences, but I'm working on a subject that largely has to do with the astronomical sciences as well, I tend to look at it from the perspective of geology. And there's two underpinnings to geology that have held sway over the last couple of centuries. The older one was the idea of catastrophism. And the idea of catastrophism was that the Earth's surface was formed by a sequence of, of uh, catastrophes, huge events that don't occur as the usual business. And so the most identifiable is, is the biblical flood, the, de the deluge, as you're, you're looking at here. Um, starting with this fella, James Hutton, who was at Edinburgh in the 18th century and was part of the Scottish Enlightenment, um, catastrophism gave way to what we call uniformitarianism, which means the earth is basically a product of everyday processes. Now, this seemed unlikely in his day because we didn't really know how old the earth was, and these processes were very slow. So it took a real leap of faith to, to buy into this. So, but ultimately, this led to uh, something you're going to hear later tonight, the idea of plate tectonics. And plate tectonics is an underpinning for all of the geological sciences now as they pertain to the earth. And... And it's, rise, it's risen to the stature of a paradigm, meaning this, this, this underpinning theory. So the question I have, and the one I'm trying to answer tonight, is whether or not we have a paradigm for the origin of the solar system. And I'm going to uh, put forward the thesis to you that we have an emergent paradigm. It's largely incomplete, but it's one that we're working on and making real progress. This, this, this is a product of studying meteorites, astronomical observations, and using mathematical techniques like Newton's laws for gravitation. So we're going to start with answering the question, how do stars form? In order to understand the solar system, we have to know where our star came from. Uh, the best way to look at how stars form is to look out there and look for analogs for our own solar system. And this is usually done these days by uh, turning to what's called the Orion Nebula. So if you look up in the night sky and you, uh, and you look for those three stars that comprise Orion's belt, and look just down to the left of the leftmost star, you'll see a, um, a little smudge. And that little smudge is called the Orion Nebula. And inside that nebula are 2,000 stars forming today in a cluster that we can use as a model for how stars form. And one of the first things you see about star formation is that these stars, that's a star in the center part of that disk there, is they're surrounded by these, th these opaque uh, disks of gas and dust. That's the stuff of which planets are made. That's the kind of thing that made the Earth and the rest of the planets. So that's what this is really a story of. Uh, how do stars form? So let's look a little deeper into the Orion Nebula. This is a 3D depiction of the Orion Nebula. We're flying through a part of the nebula called the trapezium. So you're seeing cloud material, which is dust and molecules that we call molecular clouds. And that molecular cloud is being hollowed out by radiation from four giant stars, hence the name trapezium. And these four giant stars are burning away cloud, but leaving behind little bubbles of cloud. And inside each one of those bubbles is a little star forming. And around each little star, you'll see it as it progresses, there's a little disk, a little solar system. So as you fly through this nebula, you're seeing the cloud recessing and leaving bare solar systems, thousands of solar systems in this one region of space. So this is what we use as sort of a model. This is the kind of thing we turn to to try to develop this emerging paradigm for how the solar system formed. We're going to come up upon one example right here. You see a little disk around that star. That's sort of a very nice analogy for how we think our solar system formed. Now, these molecular clouds are happy to just sit. And so something needs to provoke them to cause them to disperse and collapse into individual stars. One idea is that they simply... Uh, uh, emerge due to turbulence. But another idea is, as you saw there, is there's a shock front from exploding supernovae adjacent to these molecular clouds. So one of the things we do when we study meteorites is look for things like telltale signs of the products of supernovae to figure out whether or not this could have been the scenario for our own solar system, whether or not some giant star exploded, caused a molecular cloud to disperse into little stars, and that's how we formed. We do that in the laboratory. This is a picture of, of my lab. We have several laboratories at UCLA like this. And these are people working on meteorites. And what we do is we torture these meteorites. We dissolve them and ask them. We grind them up. We pluck them. And we take the, pick them apart, literally atom by atom. 
and we try to figure out whether or not the things that they're composed of are actually a supernova products. That's one thing we do, for example. But further, uh, we've, we've now realized that in order to really definitively say what is, let's say, a supernova product and what is not, we have to compare our star and our solar system to other solar systems and other stars and other material from which stars are made in the interstellar space. So we increasingly are beginning to, in, in, in addition to these lab-based studies, we're turning to much larger instruments, and that is the giant telescopes. So these are two of the biggest telescopes in the world. The Keck telescopes on the left is on the summit of Mauna Kea in the big island of Hawaii. And on the right, you're looking at the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. Yes, it's really called that. And, and, and it's, in, uh, it's in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And so these two telescopes give us a way of probing interstellar space and comparing the composition of interstellar space with our own solar system. The way we do this is molecules sitting out in space, like everywhere, are in motion. They vibrate. And the frequency with which these molecules vibrate depends on their isotopic makeup. What does that mean? An element is composed of isotopes, meaning it's the same element, but each isotope has a different mass. And if you imagine two balls on springs and they have different masses, they'll vibrate differently. So that is a signature for, uh, for uh, the isotopic makeup and the chemical composition of these molecules. So we can probe that with light because light interacts with vibrating molecules, and we use these telescopes to do that. So what's a typical outcome? Here I'm showing you a graph of the abundance, the relative abundance of one isotope of oxygen on the x-axis and another isotope of oxygen on the y-axis. And we're seeing that the, gal the uh, galaxy as a whole corresponds roughly to that blue line up there. I hope it's blue. I'm colorblind. So when I say the color's wrong, you'll know why. But that's a blue bar. And the solar system is the yellow dot. And the solar system, you see, doesn't sit on that blue bar, which means we're a bit different than typical galaxy. And I've contoured on the lower right there the products of supernovae. So we've come up with an idea, which is that perhaps we're seeing in these isotopes of oxygen contamination of typical galactic material by supernova products. And that arrow depicts that sort of contamination. So that's the kind of thing we can do with these big telescopes. OK, so now we've said where the stars come from. We have some idea of what our star was, was born like. It was something like in the Orion Nebula. The next question is where do planets come from? They come from disks around the stars. So this is an image showing the evolution of a disk around a star, and you're seeing debris, dust. And so one of the questions we had is, where do oceans come from? Well, you're seeing here a depiction of water ice freezing onto dust grains in the cold part of a protoplanetary disk. And so if we can find dust like that and evidence of that water freezing out onto those dust grains, then we'll have some idea that this idea uh, that we get from astronomical observations actually can be ported to our own solar system. And indeed, when we look at the meteorites, you're gonna, there's some in the back of the uh, room here we can look at after the talks, this is, uh, when we look at the meteorites, we see that the least evolved of them are composed of these tiny dust grains that I was just showing you an animation of. They are composed of, this is a carbonaceous chondrite called Allende that fell in Mexico in 1969. And like other carbonaceous chondrites, it's composed largely of chondrules, millimeter-sized fragments of lava that were floating in space, free-floating lava in space, held together by little tiny mineral grains we call matrix, and then peppered with big white things they're about the size of your uh, fingernail, pictured up on the upper right. Those white things are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. They're like little pieces of ceramic floating in space. And when someone tells you how old the solar system is, 4.567 billion years old, it comes from uranium lead decay dating of those little white objects. They're the oldest things in the solar system. They predate the sun, or the final accumulation of the sun, I should say. So that dust I showed you in that animation is evidenced in these meteorites. We see it. Okay, now a rock like that, one of the questions you might ask is, if we, have, we built planets from rocks like that, we imagine, how common is it to have rocks like that elsewhere in the galaxy? Well, we can start to answer that question as well. Turns out that a certain kind of other stars show evidence for just those kinds of rocks in their surf, on their surfaces. This, this implies that those, those objects were pelted by rocks, and we can see the evidence of those rocks in these stars. It turns out five billion years from now, our sun is going to uh, turn into a red giant, swell up to a red giant, engulf mercury, not a good thing for the Earth, and then it's going to shed its outer shell. And this is a snapshot of a star doing just that. It's losing its outer shell. It's blowing off its outer shell, 
And in the core, in the middle, there's a little dot, and that little dot is called a white dwarf. And it's about the size of the Earth, but it's roughly the mass of the Sun, so it's a highly dense object. If you put elements like magnesium, silicon, calcium, iron, the things that rocky planets are made of, onto the surface of that star, they very quickly sink to the center, out of view. So if you see those elements in that star, using how light interacts with the star, that, those elements have to be the residues of a collision between that star and, say, some asteroids or perhaps a rocky planet. So by, I have colleagues at UCLA who look at these white dwarfs, they identify those elements, and they can tell us that those elements are in the, abund the relative abundances just like our carbonaceous chondrites. So they see evidence of carbonaceous chondrites in other stars. So our rocks, as I've written here, rocks are rocks. Our rocks are like rocks in other stellar systems. So that's sort of reassuring. That makes us seem quite normal, I think. It makes our rocks seem quite normal, not you folks. So, uh, so we're on the subject of where do planets come from? Well, I've, we've talked about the disk, we've talked about the dust, and I've said that the rocks are kind of normal. Now we get to actually making planets. Now, the giant planets, the biggest gaseous planets, we actually know the least about how they form. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But one uh, train of thought is if you look, this is views looking down on the disk. And if the disk is turbulent it, can, turbulent, it can spit off little eddies. And these little turbulent eddies can accrete to form a gas giant planet. And so you're seeing one on the lower right panel. This is a simulation. We think Jupiter and Saturn and planets like that probably form in this kind of scenario, and they form quite quickly. They're the first things to form. But more interesting for the question of where we come from is how you build the rocky planets, or what we call the terrestrial planets. And that turns out to be a story of collisions. And so when you look up at the night sky and you look at the moon, you're seeing the scars from that phase in the early solar system when collisions were rife. Everything was about collisions. Rocks were smacking rocks, and these, these rocks were sometimes sticking together, and they were growing these rocky planets, growing Mercury, growing Venus, Earth, Mars, and some of the asteroids. So when you look, again, when you look up at the moon and you see those scars, you should be thinking, ah, this is, this is a leftover from that time when the, giant, uh, when the terrestrial planets were formed. Um, what were the things that were smacking the moon? What were those things causing those craters? Well, the vestiges of those little things we call planetesimals we see today as asteroids in the asteroid belt between, between uh, Mars and Jupiter, and we see them as comets, and comets are littered all over the solar system. So on the left is an image of a comet, and on the right is an image of an asteroid. Now the question is, now we get a little technical. Now we've identified what these rocks are, what they look like, how do they form planets? So we can go to the computer to answer that question and just use Newton's laws of gravitation. So what I'm showing here is, on the x-axis is distance from the sun in what we call an astronomical unit. That's one Earth-Sun distance. So the Earth is at one AU. And on the y-axis, I'm showing eccentricity. That's the deviation from a circular orbit. And you can imagine, the more deviations you get from a circular orbit, the more collisions you get. So it's about eccentricity and collisions. This is how you, this is how you take rocks and you slam them together to form a planet. So we can simulate this in the, in the, uh, in the computer. Now, th this is a colleague of mine's uh, depiction. What he's done is he's put a bunch of dots there, and the dots represent these little planetesimals. Think of them as asteroids, if you like. And they, they've been color-coded. The blue ones are wet, and the red ones are dry. And from the study of meteorites, we have a pretty good idea that the inner part, most part of the solar system was pretty dry, and the outer part of the solar system was pretty wet, and that's because it was colder out there and water could freeze to those little grains. You saw the animation of that. So what happens if we start letting these things collide with one another? What, what does it do in terms of planet formation? So here we go. They're bouncing around. When they pop up like that, it means they're highly eccentric orbits and they're colliding. And what you, look, Keep your eye on this thing at 1 AU. It's a little ball at 1 AU. And you'll see it go from red to kind of bluish colors. First through yellow, I think. Is it green, yellow, something? Uh, to, to the bluish colors. What you're watching is Earth accrete and getting wetter and wetter and wetter. And so what's nice is there's a synergy here between the mathematics, which tells us this is how planets grow. And in and geochemists, we actually see the evidence for these outer planetesimals that were wet hitting the Earth late in its history. And so, there's, and so this looks to us like we actually have evidence for this sort of thing really going on uh, in the early solar system. You see the Earth getting wetter and wetter. Okay, so that's... And notice the time scale. It takes tens to hundreds of millions of years to grow a planet like this tens to hundreds of millions of years. The Earth, we think, took about 100 million years to be complete, roughly. 
Okay, but that's not the end of the story. And the reason it's not the end of the story is nowadays we can look out there and see other solar systems and, and we see planets around other stars. This is relatively new. And we have a telescope out there called the Kepler telescope that's now giving us so much data that it's statistically valid. We can start looking at the myriad of types of solar systems that are out there and see whether or not our solar system is anything like it. Now, the Kepler telescope, just to give you a sense of it, works on the principle uh, that when a planet crosses uh, the, the, uh, the uh, light path of a, of a star along a line of sight towards, uh, towards the telescope, it occludes that star, and so it occludes some of that light. And so you see here the brightness varying as the circling planet uh, occludes the star. You see a little blip. Well, Kepler goes around looking for those blips, and they're very good at this, and they can figure out how many planets are circling a star, how far away the planets are from the star, and so forth. And the result of all these Kepler results is what we call the Kepler orrery. You remember the orreries? Like when you had in grade school, you had a little star, and you had a little metal piece, and the, and, you know, and the planet going around it. Well, here's an electric version, an electronic, electric, an electronic version of the orrery. And so you see a myriad of different solar systems. Now I should explain. The planets are to scale to one another. The orbits are to scale with one another. But the planets are exaggerated in size relative to the orbits so you can see them. But what, you're trying to, what I'm trying to convey here is that the, the solar system is but one architecture of all the different kinds of solar systems we're now seeing. And one of the things that comes out from this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of study is that many of those giant planets like Jupiter were very close to their star, too close to their star. They're so close that they couldn't have formed there. And that tells us that giant planets, as a rule, move. And we used to think of our solar system as all the planets formed sort of where they are. But now we have to take into account the fact that giant planets are moving. What I mean by moving, they're moving further and closer to the sun as they orbit. So they're moving in and out, in and out. This makes a very dynamic place, very different than our, our previous picture. Uh, now just to, as a little aside, I wanted to show you that we actually now get images. Of, we don't have to do this indirectly. We get images of what we call exoplanets now. This is an image of a planet around the star Fumalot. The star is being blanked out in the middle with a black patch, and all that stray light is, is scattered light. But in the box there, you see the image, actual image of an exoplanet, which is pretty exciting. Okay, so let's go back to that animation I showed you before about how you build an Earth. Well, what is the fact that Jupiter and Saturn, for example, are careening through the solar system due to that picture? So there's a, I have another colleague at UCLA named Brad Hansen who was looking for the answer to the, to the question, why is Mars so small? Age-old question, actually, in solar system research. Mars is ridiculously small. Well, he suggested that all the planetesimals need to pile up at about where Earth is today before they made Mars. Well, these fellas came along and did a model and said, you know how you can do that? You can move Jup Jupiter from where it is into the inner solar system and have Saturn tagging along behind as it grows. And let's watch what it does to the planetesimals. It scatters them, and it takes them to about one astronomical unit and piles them up, just like Brad wants them. Now we can make a small Mars. But the problem is Jupiter's not where Earth is today, right? You all know it's much further out. So it's got to turn around. Well, it turns out Saturn and Jupiter interact with, it, with each other if the model is tuned just right. And they will actually turn around, and we call this the grand tack. It's a sailing analogy. So Jupiter and Saturn are going in, and then they tack out. Okay? So what happens when they tack out? Well, when they tack out, they not only scatter the planetesimals in the inner solar system, now they're going to start interacting with those outer solar system planetesimals, which are colored here in blue, the wet stuff. Now watch what happens when they tack back out. They scatter the blue stuff and the red stuff together. They intermingle them. And this is actually what the asteroid belt looks like. It's got dry stuff, wet stuff, intermingled. And so this is an explanation for not only why Mars is small, but why the asteroid belt looks the way it does. Now, this is not the answer, but I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to convey to you that we have an emerging paradigm, or at least we're getting the rules down right. Giant planets move. Okay, so I'll sum up by just saying we are the products of the usual business of star formation. So if you go back to this catastrophism and uniformitarianism, yes, we were born of catastrophes, but it's sort of the ultimate uniformitarianism that we are just the normal business of star formation. We're the schmutz left over. That's it.